comfortable and find a seat. It feels eerie with the fog rolling in, like we're going to step off a cliff. But. So you are here, I know, live at the Anchor Church. So this, uh, yesterday I was at a baby shower, and I was talking to a lady who is a film producer. She uh, produces TV shows in New York. And I asked her, I said, okay, what's your favorite show to do? Because she does Sesame Street. And, um, but she said what her very favorite thing to do is live television because you never know what's going to happen. And I thought, no, that's what we're, this morning we're having tech, techie problems. And I think, you know, it's, I like to have do-overs, but here we don't get do-overs. So it, it's kind of like life, too. We never know what life's going to happen. It just makes it exciting. But we do know that God holds our future, and we can trust in the hope that we have in him because what he provides is enough, right? Right. Okay, so anybody see the sermon teaser out on the table? What did you see? Yes. Yes, okay. Oh, my porky pig. Yeah, Bill got it, porky pig. So, and do you know what, uh, what porky pig says? What does he do? Yes, thank you. That's it. That's all, folks. So, so Rick this morning, his sermon is Don't Be Like Porky Pig. And so we're going to talk, he's going to talk about our hope that is in us. So Porky Pig and Jesus, I don't know how it goes together. But. Okay. So we're, let's sing about God and that he has done great things. Here we go. One, two.
Nothing can pluck us from your hand, Father. Our eternity is secure as well as our days are now, that we walk in your love and nothing can keep us from your love and your grace. Uh, thank you for your continued gift of grace every day and every waking moment that our hope and security is in you and as we walk hand in hand. Thank you for being so faithful. We are so undeserving, so we worship you, Father, with our, our voices and our lives. Thank you for your grace, and our hope is in you. Amen. Amen. All right, well, say good morning to your neighbor this morning. Okay, we're going to get rolling here pretty quick. Just uh, want to let you know, a little word from the front lines. I was with uh, my son Toby last night. I uh, got a report from the emergency room, which is, you know, where he works as a doctor. And he, uh, the, if the things you've been reading about in the newspaper about COVID, they're all true. He has been inundated with uh COVID cases uh, over the last couple of weeks. They, he had gone 
literally a couple of months without seeing a COVID case until just the last few weeks. The last couple of weeks, it's been uh, all COVID all the time. Uh, so there's a lot going on. Uh, and he says almost all unvaccinated, uh, the patients that are coming in, he's had a couple of vaccinated patients who had compromised immune systems. So, um, so the threat is real. It's going on. I asked him, well, you know, where do you think this is going to go? And he said, nobody knows, um, and it's kind of scary. So um, we should be praying, and make sure you protect yourselves. Uh, make sure you take care of that problem so you don't have to deal with that. Um, but it's um, be praying. Um, he said the big concern is that the, the thing is now out and is probably going to continue to mutate, and that's going to get a little scary. Th that's the bad news. The good news is, you may have seen in Great Britain, they had a similar surge, and uh, we're starting to get very worried, and all of a sudden, the cases have just dropped uh, significantly in Britain. And the thinking is, though this is not certain, the thinking is that that may be that the uh, Delta variant, which is the, now the dangerous one that's spreading, actually is going, is, what's happened there is it's burned through the unvaccinated population. And uh, there's essentially creating a herd immunity situation there, and they're hoping that that's what will happen here. We don't know yet, but uh, that's what we can hope for, and we can certainly pray for that end. So just a heads up, you know, it's interesting talking to somebody who's right there in the front line dealing with it, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis and going, oh, okay, this is not good. Um, so I'm not all that anxious about going back to the mask and the restaurants closed, so let's pray that that doesn't happen. Let's, uh, let's pray for just a moment. Father, we thank you that as we deal with um, yet another round of COVID, we're all just so tired of it. Uh, we've been tired of it for a long time. You know that, Lord. Um, we look to you. We're just thankful to you that you are the Lord of all and that you're in control even of this and that we can trust in you. Um, Lord, we thank you that there at least is some protection against this thing, and uh, we, we pray that it will, as, as hoped, will just kind of start to burn itself out, and this will level off in perhaps a few weeks. Uh, but in the meantime, Lord, we pray that you protect us from this disease and protect those we love, uh, protect, pray that we'd all be wise about this. In the larger uh, situation, Lord, we pray that you'll enable us to be light in the darkness, to give hope to people in a situation where sometimes it feels almost a little bit hopeless. Uh, so strengthen us, Lord, make us more like you. Make us uh, sources of grace and peace during this time. And we pray you'd use the time we have together this morning to strengthen us and direct us, move us in that direction, work on our hearts. We pray this through your word, Lord. We pray it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So in 2004, a little 10-year-old girl named Tilly Smith, who's from England, was with her family on the island of Phuket in Thailand on vacation. And one day they were walking, the family was walking on um, Mai Kau Beach, and she noticed the water receding and not coming back in. Two weeks before that, she had had in her school, they'd had a lesson on tsunamis, and she recognized what that meant. She recognized that's a sign of a tsunami. And so she told her parents, this means there's a tsunami coming. This is going to be dangerous. We've got to do something. And uh, her parents kind of said, oh, that's, no, come on, Tilly, don't. But she got insistent, and she began to get crying and scaring. And her, her little sister now is getting scared because she's seeing what she's doing. And so her dad just said, okay, he's going to take her back to the hotel where they were staying to try to calm her down. He tried to talk her down, and she said, Dad, it's coming. That means there's a tsunami coming. So finally her dad talked to a security guard at their hotel, and he said, I know this sounds crazy, but my daughter says there's going to be a tsunami because of what the water's doing out there. And amazingly, the guard listened. And immediately he went into action cleared the beach, people got off the beach, came into the lobby of the hotel, which was on an upper floor. And as you all know, there was indeed a tsunami, killed 230,000 people, but not one person on Maikau Beach died because of Tilly Smith. You know, 
They listen to a 10-year-old girl, and it saved their lives. You may not feel particularly eloquent or persuasive or authoritative, but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have something, some news, that everybody needs to hear more than Tilly Smith's word that a tsunami was coming. Um, we're going to think about that today as we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. We're continuing our study of the, this letter from the Apostle Peter so long ago, and here's what he wrote. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. We looked at that phrase just a little bit last week. And then he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation of the imprisoned spirits to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Okay, uh, I'm, first, there's a couple of things I need to clear up about this passage because this passage is a notoriously difficult passage of Scripture. Uh, when I went to seminary, I, we had a class where we actually had to do, everybody had to do a paper on this passage. Uh, it, uh, there was a class on exegesis, which means interpreting the Scriptures, because this one is so difficult. Uh, Martin Luther actually gave up trying to understand it. So that tells you how difficult it is. You might be saying, well, what's the difficult part? Well, it's when you get into verses 19 and 20, you know, we get uh, verse 18, Christ suffered for the sins, yep, righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, made alive in the spirit. We get that. That's the gospel. But then he says this, after he was made alive, after the resurrection, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits who were disobedient long ago in the days of Noah. When did that happen? I don't remember reading that part. Where, where did that part come from? So um, there's actually a lot of discussion about this, and there are theories on what this means that are all over the map. And um, there's actually not very much to be gained working through all of the various suggestions of what this means, uh, because like I said, at the end of the day, everybody kind of goes, yeah, we don't really know. <laughs> um, Here's what I think. I'm just going to tell you what I think and, and move on. Uh, and I think uh, Peter here is actually referencing some ancient non-biblical Jewish writings. And in those writings, it referred to angelic beings that uh, rebelled against God in the days of Noah. And um, this, Peter is saying, that something we don't know from anywhere else in Scripture, that apparently Jesus went to those angelic beings, demonic beings, if you will, at this point, uh, who were imprisoned by God, and he preached to them. And what did he preach to them? He proclaimed his victory over evil. He proclaimed that they lost. He's basically trash-talking. Uh, so um, what, why is Peter talking about that? Well, there's a very good reason. He's drawing an analogy. He's saying, you, the readers that he wrote to, were suffering. They were struggling. They were being persecuted. And he said, you're suffering, but you're suffering for doing good. And that's a good, good thing, that you're doing what's right. Um, and what you need to know is that Christ also suffered, suffered more than you. And he got victory. And his victory ensured that though you are suffering now, victory is ahead. That's what he's telling them. Now, there's another part of the passage that causes some heartburn for some people in verse 21 when Peter says, well, there's, there's sort of an analogy here between Noah being saved through water and us being saved through baptism because baptism now saves you. And you think, wait a minute, aren't we saved by grace, you know, through faith? Uh, what is this about baptism now saves you? Um, all Peter is saying here 
I need to be careful. To, he's clarifying it's not the physical act of being baptized that actually does anything. Um, he says it's the, uh, the New American Standard translation is a better translation of this. It says, baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. In other words, the act of baptism symbolizes physically saying to God, I need forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And I realize that I'm being given a new life through Christ by being forgiven. The appeal of a conscience cleansed through the blood of Christ. That's what he's saying here. So that's what, what's going on there. But now let's back up and say, well, but what is really the main thrust of this passage? Well, this passage actually addresses our call to tell people about Jesus. Believers in Jesus Christ are given this great news, and he says you, you, you're not supposed to keep that to yourself. You're supposed to tell people about that. Oh, great. This is about evangelism, isn't it? <laughs> Everybody's one of those. There's a couple of things that cause guilt for a lot of Christians, most of us. Two things. One is prayer. Most of us feel like I should have, I should pray more. I should be stronger in prayer than I am. I feel like I'm not doing well enough there. And the other one, eh, telling people about Jesus. Yeah, nah, I don't like that one. Man. That's hard. Um, most of you remember Micah and Alicia Vandover, who uh, served as missionaries for a time from our church, and we supported. Those two uh, are beautiful people who are amazing evangelists. They talk to everybody about Jesus. I mean, you hear their stories, and they talk about their experiences encountering people in coffee shops and on the beach and their neighborhood and tell them about Jesus and how lives are impacted. And you listen to those things, and you say, that is so cool, and I could never do that. That's uh, not me, you know. That's just like, wow, I'm not that bold. I'm not that outgoing. I, I don't come up with the right thing to say. I, I don't even see the opportunity sometimes to say anything. And when I try, I drop the ball. And, um, you know, the reality is I believe that many of us have a fear about evangelism, but our fear is we're actually going to do it so badly that we do the reverse of what we want. We're going to drive people away from Jesus. And it's like, I don't want to do that. Um, Here's the great news. This, this verse, verse 15, is great news because it has a model for carrying out the command that God has given to every believer to tell others about Jesus, a model that all of us can employ. This is, I like to think of this as, this is evangelism for the rest of us. That, you know, there are gifted evangelists, and the Vandovers are a couple of examples who are amazing. Most of us are not like that. But this is for the rest of us. This is something we can all do. It's not hard, but it requires three things. And I'm going to point those out to you this morning. The first one is it requires hope. He says, here's what you need to do. Just be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the hope you have. Oh, well, we can do that, right? Um, and so in order for them to ask about it, you have to have it. They have to see the hope in you. Now, it, you might say, well, now, wait a minute. Um, Peter identifies hope as a thing people would notice about a, a follower of Jesus. Didn't Jesus say that the people will know that we're his disciples by our love? Yes, he did. He said uh, that that is the mark of a Christian but the interesting thing about that is that's probably not the first thing that people are going to notice about a Christian. Um, the first thing they're going to notice is, why is this person, why does this person have so much peace? Why does this person have so much joy? And particularly, if you want to think about um, the people that Peter wrote to, many of them, maybe most of them were slaves, all of them were poor, they were persecuted, oppressed. They were ostracized from their community. So imagine a person in that situation with all that difficulty still being peaceful, joyful, rejoicing, and hopeful. People are going to notice that. They would say a person in your circumstances ought to be pretty grumpy and complaining and kind of bitter. Why aren't you? What is it with you? That's what Peter's saying. People are going to notice that and go, you know, I don't understand that, 
but I love it because I wish I had it. So what is that and where does it come from? Here's the thing. People are desperate for hope. Without hope, we don't thrive. Without hope, in the long term, we won't even survive. Hope is what gives us the ability to just keep going, to persevere. You know, Lori and I have been to two Padre games this last month. This is kind of unusual for us. We don't go to a lot of Padre games. We went to two games this last month. And, you know, in part, it's exciting because the Padres, up until recently, haven't been horrible. Uh, you know, it used to be you'd always go to the Padre game and, you know, they'd be blown out by the, the third inning. You'd go, yeah, well, that's what I thought. They, they stink. I'm, you know, we can go home. Well, so we go to two Padre games. The first one, they were down eight to nothing after three innings. Like, oh boy, it's like the Padres of old. Um, and the second one, we went Friday night, the Padre pitching once again blew up and they were down nine to nothing by the fourth inning. Now, the, the interesting thing is that in both games, by the third or fourth inning, game is over, you know it, and we were saying, well, we came all the way here, we should probably stick around, maybe get through the fifth inning or something, you know, get over at least halfway through, and then we'll just go home because this game's not going to be interesting. And not even that they aren't going to win, it's not even going to be interesting. The interesting thing about that is that in the first game, we stayed till almost to the very end of that game. In the second game, we left after the fifth inning. What was the difference? Well, in the first game, when they were down eight to nothing in the bottom of the fourth inning, the Padres miraculously scored six runs. And it was all sparked by a near miraculous, unheard of, improbable, history making Grand Slam home run by a Padres relief pitcher batting who had just been brought up from the minors. He had a grand slam home run, and all of a sudden, it's eight to six. This is actually a game they could actually win. There was hope, and so we stayed. In the other game, the one Friday night, Padres' best player, the spark plug of that team, Fernando Tatis, got injured in the first inning, and you could see the air come out of that team. They just died. And we watched through five innings and said, there is no chance they are ever going to get in this game. Let's just go home. And that's what we did. We left. And sure enough, they never did get in that game. What was the difference? One game we had hope, so we stayed and stuck it out. One game we didn't, so we quit. And that's what hope does for all of us. We have hope. We can keep going. If we don't have hope, we shrivel up and die. What is the hope that we have in Christ that, that Peter is talking about here? Well, it's actually a very large hope that has a number of aspects to it. Uh, when, when we think about hope, most of the time our hope is about circumstances, things in this life. You know, I, I've been struggling, having a mighty struggle for the last couple of weeks with allergies and sinus problems. It's been bad. Well, I have an appointment a week from tomorrow with my otolaryngologist, which is ear, nose, and throat specialist, who, and she's really good. And I have hope that I will go there and she will treat that and I will get some relief. Uh, you know, I hope that everybody in my family stays healthy. Now, I have hope uh, that, you know, when it comes time for me to retire, we'll have enough money to live. And I hope that this latest threat of the COVID variant doesn't return us to the darkest days of 2020. Uh, and the truth is that life is really an unending stream of hopes. You know, our hopes are what keep us going. We, we have all these things that we hope for. And there's nothing wrong with those hopes. They are natural and they're good. But the problem is when we tend to base uh, our whole outlook and our attitude about life on those hopes, which is what we do tend to do, hopes about our circumstances, that we're setting ourselves up for a failure because those hopes cannot sustain our lives. Earlier in 1 Peter, in chapter 1, verse 3, Peter wrote this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new, new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God has given us a new hope 
with it, brings with it a whole new life. This new hope can sustain life eternally. And that is the hope that we have. Now, um, I want to explain a little bit more about that. In Galatians 5.5, 5, in the English Standard Translation of Galatians 5.5, 5, it reads this, this way. Through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Really, we do? Most people say, no, I'm really not waiting for the hope of righteousness, actually. I don't really think much about it. Here's the amazing thing about that. Uh, Paul, who wrote Galatians, was correct. We wait for the hope of righteousness because every human being longs for righteousness. We don't know it most of the time. Um, but we do. We hope for it every day of our lives. And we don't know it's righteousness that we're hoping for because we don't recognize what righteousness actually is. You know, we tend to think of it as that's some religious thing. You're going to be a really good person, you know. Not quite it. In fact, not really close to it. A short definition of righteousness is that it means to be declared to be right. It's a stamp of approval. You know, if you buy some meat, go to the grocery store, buy some meat, you always want to make sure it has the USDA seal of approval on it, right? That seal of approval says this meat is right. It's not going to make you sick. Uh, it's righteous meat. That's what that means, that seal of approval. <laughs> and the truth is, every human being, every single one of us, longs to be given a seal of approval, which is righteousness. You know, why do we want people to think well of us? You ever wonder about that? Why, why do you concern yourself? We all do about what people think. Why, why do we uh, try to explain so hard, explain ourselves when we're misunderstood? Why do we defend ourselves when we feel like we've been unfairly accused or blamed? Why, why do we have an insatiable desire for affirmation and approval from other people? Why are those things there? It is because all of us have a longing for righteousness, a seal of approval. And Lori reminded me this week of one of those just classic instances, events in our marriage. Happened, uh, you know, probably maybe 10 years ago, maybe more, I don't know. Um, we had gone to the airport to pick up our niece who was flying back home here to San Diego. And her flight was delayed. So we sat on a bench in one of the concourses at Terminal 1 down at uh, Lindbergh Field to just wait until her flight came in. And so you're sitting there and we're watching hundreds of people walking back and forth to, to and from flights, you know. And at one point, I'd use the men's room, so I went to the men's room. And on my way back, something on the floor caught my eye. Uh, oh, that's just weird. I went over and I sat down next to Lori and I said, Lori, this is really strange. But somehow, some lady apparently has dropped a pair of her underwear out there on the floor of the, the, the concourse. Uh, I must have fallen out of her bag or something, and there it is. And I pointed out, and Lori just started laughing hysterically. I said, well, it's not that funny. Why do you think that's so funny? And she goes, I think that's my underwear. <laughs> I said, how is that possible? How, how could that have happened? And uh, so there's a, Lori has an interesting quirk about her. Um, her quirk is that she does things like um, she, she takes off shoes with laces without untying them. She, you know, she, I, she, for her, they're slip-offs. I don't know why she does. But and, and along that line, she also has a tendency sometimes to be in a hurry when she's getting, you know, undressed, and she just will take her underwear and her pants off all the one, all the way off, all, everything goes off. And she had apparently done that and the underwear had stayed in the pants, and she was wearing those pants. And when she was walking along, apparently, unbeknownst to her, had dropped out of her leg onto the floor. So the really interesting part is that she says to me, Rick, go pick them up. I said, I'm, I'm not going to go out there and pick up some women, carry around women's underwear. I, you know, I didn't want people to look at me and just going, well, look at that freaky, weird dude. He seems to be into women's underwear. I'm not doing that, you know. And uh, she said, 
Well, I said, why don't you do it? Very chivalrous, you know. Um, so here's the question. Why would I even care about that? I cared about what I might look like, what people would think. And Lori did too because she didn't want to go out there and pick them up either. You know, we're both going, yeah, we don't want to look stupid. These are people we don't even know. They're probably not even going to pay attention to us, but there's always that thing of, ooh, what do I look like? I don't want to be embarrassed. Here's the thing. Embarrassment has its roots in our desire for righteousness. Anytime we're thinking about, what do people think of me? How, I want to be well thought of. It's because I want a seal of approval. It is all about righteousness. And here's the key on this deal. There is no amount of approval that human beings can give us that will satisfy that longing. And we all know it because it never goes away. I mean, I'm kind of a long in years here, you know, been around a long time, and I still care about what people think. For Furthermore, I still want affirmation. I want people to say, oh, yeah, you're wonderful. We all want that. No matter how much you get, it's never enough. Why is that? Because we need an infinite seal of approval, and that can only come from the infinite, and that's God himself. And that's what we long for. And that's why Peter said, we are eagerly waiting for the the righteousness that's from God. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul said, For our sake, he, meaning God the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. How do we get God's seal of approval? We always think it's by, I, I need to earn it, I need to be good enough to get that, and we'll never get there that way. That's why Jesus had to die on a cross, because we can't make it that way. And so God has provided this way for us to be given his righteousness simply by accepting the gift he offers through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Peter, uh, or excuse me, Paul wrote that we eagerly wait for it. Well, if we have that righteousness of Christ, why are we eagerly waiting for it? What he's talking about is, We're waiting for that day when we actually hear God say to us, well done, my beloved, you are welcome in my kingdom forever. And we experience the the results of being righteous before God because of what he has done for us, not because of what we have done. Right now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are righteous before God. You are forgiven. You are reconciled to him. You are connected to him. He approves of you as you are. He loves you as you are. He accepts you as you are. He rejoices over you as you are today. You know, we struggle sometimes to to believe that. We we forget it. Um, That's part of why we eagerly wait for that day when we will be in God's presence and we will no longer have to struggle with that because we'll see it and hear it from him. That's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, that hope is huge because it touches on a lot of life. Uh, For instance, all of us hope, you know, we're talking about this approval thing, we hope that we're acceptable human beings, that we're loved, that our lives are worthwhile, that they mean something, and we hope for those things, but most of us, you know, most of the time, or a good part of the time, we're not sure of them. We struggle. We see our shortcomings, and we feel like, ah, man, could God really love me, and I... I don't know, does my life really mean anything? Uh, you know, here's the word. In, in Christ, our hope is that God answers all those questions. Yes, you are loved, you are worthwhile, you are acceptable, you have great meaning. I approve of you and I love you. And there's even more. In life, you know, there's all these random um, and difficult things that happen to us. Often, a lot of the time, life looks chaotic and Random and, and, in many cases, disappointing. There are lots of hardships along the way. You know, Lori and I uh, have both lost a parent. We, as you all know, we experienced the death of a child. We have a granddaughter who has two serious and potentially life-impacting medical problems. 
Um, we've been stabbed in the back by friends. We've been abandoned by friends. Uh, we've had you know, financial struggles. We've had all kinds of stuff that you look at and say, man, don't hope for any of that. Um, here's the hope we have in all of that, and that all of us have in Christ. God is with us. He loves us, and so he's with us, and he's going to protect us. Psalm 3.3 3 says, You, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. In verse 5, it says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. So that says, when we have this hope and this relationship with God, God is going to be with us, and that is what's going to sustain us in the difficult times and give us peace so that we can rest and wake up and be sustained by God's presence with us. In Ephesians 1.10, it says that God is summing up all things in Christ. That means that history is going somewhere. Everything has a point to it. All of the things that happen in our lives have meaning. None of it is wasted. All of this as part of having that hope. And of course, the, the biggest maybe part of that is When we are no longer on this earth, we are going to live again in God's presence forever. And that is a certain hope. It's not a wish. It's founded in the fact that Jesus Christ defeated death when he rose from the dead. Now, what we need to do is contrast with the the characteristics of the things that we hope for in this life. Here are some things we need to know about the things, anything in this life. First, there's something wrong with all of it. Nothing is perfect in this world, right? If you think about it, if you think long enough about it, you go, you know what, I wish this was that way, not this way, you know. For instance, for Lori and me, paradise is a tropical island with warm ocean waters and beautiful beaches. Ah, man, that, I mean, that is paradise there. You know what, it's not perfect. You know what comes with that tropical beach scene? Uh, That lovely warm ocean water contains jellyfish. And if you have an encounter with a jellyfish, that's the farthest thing from paradise. And that lovely warm ocean water contains sharks. Uh, You have an encounter with a shark, it's going to ruin your whole day. Uh, And here's the thing. Let's take Hawaii, which is our favorite place. This year in Hawaii... There have already been six shark attacks, well, almost one a month in Hawaii. One of those shark attacks took place in three feet of water. Yeah, aren't the tropics great, you know? And oh, by the way, uh, if you're out in the sun too much, you're going to get a horrendous sunburn. If you stay out there too long, you're going to get skin cancer. And oh, by the way, if you happen to get a cut when you're in the tropical water, it's probably going to get infected. And oh, by the way, all that beautiful lush vegetation, tropical vegetation, has a lot of mosquitoes and, oh yes, cockroaches. Sounds like a nightmare, right? That's what this world is like. If you, any place that you say, oh, this is my beautiful place, if you look at it long enough, you'll go, yeah, you know, there's some things about that I really, really don't like. Uh, Oh, we live in one of the best places on earth. Yeah, earthquakes, ah, you know. And everything in this world is like that. There's something just a little bit wrong with it. So there's that. The second aspect of things is that nothing lasts here. Have you noticed that? Um, All good things must come to an end. Yeah, why is that? That's kind of annoying, isn't it? it, But it's true. You know, where's the law that says that has to happen? Uh, Have you ever bought a new car and just been excited about it? Oh, man, it smells so good and everything works and looks beautiful. It's like, look at my new car. What happens about five or six years down the road, you know? It's just a car, you know. Now it's got a few scratches and dings and, you know, stuff doesn't work on it. And you're starting to think about, I'd like to have a new one. (laughs) And everything in life is like that. Uh, And there's one other thing uh, about stuff in this world, and that is that they tend to be a little bit anticlimactic. Classic illustration of that is sports. A team wins the Super Bowl. This is the pinnacle. This is the dream, the hope for achievement. And they finally have won the the big prize, the Super Bowl, and there's a big celebration. The city has a parade. And then what happens? 
Well, life just goes on, and a new season comes along, and what you did last year doesn't mean anything. And the fact is, Super Bowl, who won the Super Bowl three years ago? I have no idea. It was probably New England, but I don't know. I'm just guessing, you know. It doesn't last. And, and we all know that kind of thing from when we were kids. And Christmas was coming. And we're so excited about the toys we were going to get. And we got those toys, and it was just mind-boggling. It was so wonderful. What happened a week later? It's over. And the toys are just toys. It's kind of anticlimactic. It's kind of how life is. You think of those highest moments of your life, and they were wonderful. Now they're gone, and life just kind of goes on. So what all this tells us is that if our hopes are in things in this world, what is going to happen? We're going to end up disappointed and disillusioned because none of it is perfect, nothing lasts, and it all ends up being a little bit anticlimactic. Everything is going to be like that. Our hope has to be for something beyond that. In 1 Peter 1, 4, and 5, it says, we have this living hope in Christ that includes an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's permanent. It doesn't fade. It's beautiful. It's shielded by God's power, he says. It's forever. Um, when Peter refers to our hope, that's what he's talking about. We have righteousness in Christ, and with that righteousness comes this, this inheritance that is forever, eternal life, and a relationship with God right now. It is acceptance. It's the seal of approval. All of that, all, all wrapped up into that one incredible hope in Christ. Now, if anyone is ever going to ask about that hope, we are going to have to be living in the reality of it. That, that's where we kind of get off base sometimes. We kind of go through life thinking like just putting our hopes, or everybody else puts their hopes, and we have the same result they do. We go up and down with the circumstances, and we get disappointed because life is never quite good enough. And Wait a minute. We're going to have to learn to live in the reality. Let's go focusing on, oh my goodness, look at what I have in Christ because that is what is going to sustain me through the inevitable ups and downs of our circumstances that are going to come. So that's where we start. Peter says, here's the thing. If you're going to be able to actually do this thing that God wants you to tell others about Christ, you're going to have to have that hope. But then there's a second thing that we're going to have to have, and that is a reason for the hope. Okay, somebody comes along and says, okay, <laughs> I see this hope in you, and you're, you know, why are you so joyful, so peaceful? Why are you so hopeful all the time? Um, well, so the second thing we need to do is be able to give an answer to those kinds of questions. We don't have to preach to them. We don't have to back up our semi-tractor or trailer rig full of our apologetics arguments and dump the whole load on them. We just need to say, oh, well, here's what I hope for, and here's why. Um, you know, Lori and I have had a an experience on multiple occasions that reminds me of this, and that is that we have been repeatedly asked, you know, when people here, you know, like in restaurants, and oh, we're celebrating an anniversary, or when we went at a jewelry store buying a present for Lori and for an anniversary, and oh, how long have you guys been married? Well, almost 42 years now, and they always they look at Lori and they go, "Did you get married when you were three? You know, how did that happen?" But they don't do that when they look at me. I get, yeah, you're old, but. But here's the thing. It's amazing how many times we have been asked, you guys, you look so much in love and you look so happy and married for that long. What is your secret? Um, how, how have you done that? You know, um, I usually tell people, well, my secret is I married Lori because <laughs> that makes life really fun. But that doesn't help most people because there's only one Lori. So we need to have a better answer. And the interesting thing is that the first time that happened to us, I didn't have a very coherent answer for it. Um, and uh, I thought through that question. I, didn't, you know, I, what, I, I don't know. Uh, so um, it occurs to me that I needed... After that happened, I needed to think through, well, okay, what is it that, makes, uh, that has 
sustained our marriage and has created this thing where we really love each other. And we had to think through what that was involved. What would I tell someone? And that's what Peter is telling us we need to be able to do in regard to the hope that we have. Uh, because if we don't, then someone says, well, what is this with your hope? And we'll stumble around and babble around and we'll sound like Porky Pig. Ba-dee, ba-dee, ba-dee. That's all, folks. You know, well, Not very helpful. Um, and most of us who are Christians, if you've been a Christian a while, you've probably had an experience where someone asked something about your faith and you sounded like Porky Pig. Ba-dee, ba-dee, ba-dee. That's all, folks. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Porky Pig is fine in a cartoon, but I would rather people not think that anyone who believes in Jesus is kind of like him. We need to have something to say. And we need to be able to do it in a simple way and fairly brief way. And so I think when someone asks about your faith, you should be able to answer three questions. What makes you as hopeful as you are? How does this hope help you? And why do you believe in this hope? I would suggest that you take some time on your own and actually sit down and write out your answer to those questions. What makes you as hopeful as you are? How does this hope help you? Why did you believe in this hope? You need to be able to phrase those things for yourself. Here's what I would say. This is just how I would put it. I have hope because God has forgiven me, loves me, and accepts me and values me because of what his son Jesus Christ has done on my behalf. And because of this, I know I have eternal life. How that hope helps me is it helps me know that God is always with me. He loves me. He will work out good for me in every situation. My life has great meaning and value. And that I have uh, no need to fear anything, even death. And why, then, would you have this? Why would you believe that? Well, I believe this because I know that in real life history, Jesus Christ died for me and then conquered death on my behalf, proving that he was who he claimed to be. God in human form. You need to write your own script and then know it well enough so if someone asks you, you can do better than bidee, 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 that's all, folks. You know. So, one more thing we need to have. Peter mentions, he says, okay, you got to have the hope and be prepared to give an answer for everyone who asks about that, but, big but here, do this with gentleness and respect got to have gentleness when we tell anybody about our faith. There's a guy named Dave Roseberry who's a a pastor, and he related something that happened to him. Uh, His his shoulder had become extremely painful, and he couldn't hardly move it. And so he went to see his doctor. The doctor told him, well, you've got a frozen shoulder, which is something that can result from age and use. And so the doctor prescribed physical therapy and a cortisone shot in the shoulder. Okay, so as he's preparing the injection, the doc asks Roseberry, so what do you do for a living? What's your job? And Roseberry says, well, I'm a pastor. I preach for a living. You go to church? The doctor says, no, I gave that up a long time ago. But we can take care of this. Just relax. We'll get this shoulder loosened up so you can continue to point your finger at people. (laughs) Oh, man. You know, obviously his experience with pastors and with probably all religious people, is they do a lot of finger pointing. Yeah, you sinner, you got to, you know what? Peter says that's the wrong approach. That does not work. Uh, You need to be gentle. In fact, God says being gentle is an important quality. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says that one of the fruit of the Spirit, one of the results of living in the Spirit of Christ is gentleness. In Philippians 4, 5, Paul wrote, Let your gentleness be evident to all. Let everybody see how gentle you are. James 3.17, the New American Standard Translation says, The wisdom from above, God's wisdom, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits. We shouldn't seek to combat people or be defensive or argumentative or blaming. We should be loving, gentle, reasonable. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Doesn't mean weak. Jesus was the strongest person who's ever lived. But he was gentle. What does gentle mean? It means to actually care for another person. 
to respect them and want to do them good, not harm, to be sensitive to their feelings and to their thinking. It's like, you know, when you're going to take a Band-Aid off a child, you just go, eh, rip that thing off there. Ah! No, you want to do it as gently as possible because you care for that child. That's what this Peter says we need to have. One of the greatest coaches of all time, the, the late uh, John Wooden, basketball coach, said he learned gentleness from watching his dad, and he said this, it takes great strength on the inside to be gentle on the outside. Here's the thing. If we are actually confident in what we believe in Christ, confident that, in fact, Christ has risen from the dead, he's who he claimed to be, and that we have eternal life through him, and that we're forgiven, if we know that, we won't be threatened if someone disagrees with us. Well, that's fine. Uh, you know, we can be gentle because we know what's true. Here's the thing. Without the Spirit of Christ working in people's lives, they are spiritually dead. That's what actually the Ephesians says about everybody. We all start off life kind of spiritually dead, and the only thing that can change that is if God reaches in and brings us to life. Here's the thing. When I share you know, about my faith, when you share about your faith, we can't convince anybody of anything. We can't make anybody come to life. Only God can do that. God says, I just want you to let them know what's true. You've seen it in your life. And see if God is going to work in their lives starts with us living in the profound, life-changing reality of that living hope in Christ. You know, yesterday, sorry, yesterday was the, the date that 24 years ago my, my dad's life came to an end. And I remember vividly the day that um, the doctor delivered the bad news that, you know, the chemo's not working and there's nothing more that can be done. It was gut-wrenching. It was devastating. My dad's reaction was amazing. <laughs> he looked at my mom and he said, nothing has changed. He had rock-solid hope in his Lord Jesus Christ, confidence in him, and he knew that he was going to live in his presence forever. He was not afraid of that. He looked forward to that. And the remaining weeks of his life, he was always at peace, always full of hope. And people saw it, and it made an impact. We have tremendous hope at every moment of life because Jesus has won the victory for us, and he is with us. He will never leave us. And if we live in the reality of those truths and rejoice in that hope every day, it will be noticed. So let's do that. And as we do that, let's make sure that we prepare to have a better response than ba dee ba dee That's all, folks. So let's pray. Father, um, we rejoice in the hope that you've given to us through your son, Jesus Christ. It is a hope that we know can sustain our lives. And we know that this is too good as news to just sit on it and keep it from others. We all, for the most part, um, are not great at uh, being evangelists. But we all can live in hope, and we can all be ready if someone asks us to explain that. So help us, Lord, first of all, and most of all, to live in the reality of that hope, to know who we are in you, to know what you have done for us, to be rock solid in our faith in that. We pray that you'll use that hope to strengthen us and buoy us so that as we go through the difficult times, even in the difficult times, we'll have that hope and that will make the difference. And in the light of that difference, Father, as people see that, I pray that we will be able to explain to them while it's, what it's about why it's there when they ask. We pray that you'll actually use us to enable others to experience that same hope. We pray this in the name Amen. of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, please stand and sing this great hymn of hope.
So my name now is Lori Underwear, I think. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Okay. Uh, we're, gonna, we're not doing this. Sorry. Okay, here we go.